Summary of Tableau 11, The Fabulous Limit Laws, Part 3, The Bell Curve Flits In, Why Poles Really Work. At the heart of our short lecture today was the discovery of the Central Limit Theorem and the ubiquitous nature of the bell curve. The sum of independent perturbations behaves essentially as if it were governed by a normal law. Suitably centered and scaled, the probability of a sum lying between, in any interval, say between A and B, is given approximately by the area under the bell curve in that interval. This remarkable theorem has informed a host of applications, all fueled by the idea that sums are endemic in science and mathematics and engineering. So, we've already seen some applications in play. In mathematical statistics, starting with poles, drug testing, and more generally, in estimations of a mean. The central limit theorem crops up in biology, various estimates of height, weight, intelligence, and so forth, are frequently assumed to have a normal characterization. Again, presumably, because underlying it is a sum of perturbations which are not quite controlled. The normal law crops up in physics. Black body radiation, if you've taken a course in thermodynamics, for example. It crops up in astronomy, in the cosmic background radiation, which is the ghostly afterimage of the Big Bang. It crops up in sociology, where you have large numbers of people milling around in their own independent fashions. It crops up in engineering, in the characterization of noise, noise in your television sets, noise in your phones, noise in satellite communications. It crops up in economics and mathematical finance. If you think about agents involved in finance as many independent entities, then again we have fertile ground here for a potential bell curve to emerge. It's a very rich panoply of possibilities. This is a good place to conclude. Let's take stock of what we've done in the last eight weeks. We began with chance experiments and tried to deduce what a mathematical framework for them should be. And we came up, ultimately, with the idea of a sample space of possible outcomes, events as subsets or aggregates of these sample points, and probability measure as an additive set function which ascribes chance to these events. Building upon this foundation, we discovered how we could fold inside information in the form of conditional probabilities and happen then upon the fundamental concept, that of independence. Independence is fundamentally a rule of products. And once we had this under our belt, we could immediately delve into applications of quite some heft and subtlety. We came back to poles. And in poles, we find that estimates of populations are independent sums. The binomial distribution swam into view and the Poisson distribution attached to it. And the characterization of these distributions led us ultimately to the fabulous limit laws. The law of large numbers at its heart is perhaps the most intuitive component of the theory of probability. It says something about averages for which we have a lot of intuition. The law of large numbers already validates why poles work, why drug testing works. But digging deeper in, we discovered, against all odds, this beautiful, this serendipitous, this marvelous object, the bell curve. 
And this gives us ultimately an ultimate validation for why all these application domains thrive, why the mathematical theory gives you a firm foundation. It is fitting that we concluded as we began with the toss of a coin. Quo Vatis, where does a student go from here? If your objective was to get an understanding of how chance plays a role in life around us, to get more than a superficial understanding, a, an understanding which is principled, which has a firm mathematical foundation, then you have all that you need. With just this, these short eight weeks, as you've seen, you've got a broad panoply of applications that you can apply your understanding to. But of course, there is much more to the theory that we can't cover in, in a short introductory exposure to the material. For those of you who want to dig further, well, there are fertile fields of endeavor in front of you, and I envy you their discovery. You'll discover the theory of measure and real analysis. You will discover the theory of random processes. And you, along the way, you'll discover wonderful theorems and fabulous applications. Have at it. The British poet Algernon Swinburne wrote in 1866 in his poem, The Garden of Proserpine, even the weariest river winds its way somewhere safe to say. And so it is for lecturers and classes even the most torpid lectures in a course eventually do conclude, and so do we. This concludes the entree for a course in probability. Of course, we do have a little more for those of you who wish to delve into it. So if you want a little dessert, as it were. The last tableau, tableau 12, is a dangerous bend tableau, but the applications in it are delicious. And if you're curious about a rich additional set of applications, have at it. Otherwise, I bid you adieu. The river of probability is a glorious river. The tributaries are exciting, exotic, fragrant. And I've had a long career of delving into these. I wish you the same good fortune.